What does bombastic entertainment actually mean? Bombastic entertainment is a very thin excuse to make movies. <laughs> At least that's how it started out. <laughs> uh, Brian, um, I don't know. It's it's. I don't think much of it. I just know that it's just it's it's going to be a good time. That's the best way to say it. Innovative, funny, cool, crazy. How did he do that? Brian's future. It is what it says. It's bombastic. To me, it conveys exactly what you want. If it's bombastic, that means that it's not taking itself too seriously. It's going to be fun. It's going to be different. It's not going to be something that you've seen before. Or if it is, it's a clever take on what you've seen before. Something he's had a vision of since we were kids. Worth watching. Worth paying attention to. So even if you're seeing something familiar, you're seeing it in a new way. The first movie I ever made, it was in it was in ninth grade. We were having like an art class project, and it was uh, it, it was kind of like they, they went around the class, and like every person had to pick an artist, and then because they were going in alphabetical order, like my name was way down the list. So all the and and no two people could do the same thing. So all the obvious choices, like the Vincent Van Gogh, was gone, and like the M. C. Escher is just like instantly gone. So I'm racking my brain for like. You know, what, who can I do a project on? And, and I thought, like, well, you know, I've kind of been wanting to make a movie. I've been trying to, like, talk my friends into it. So I asked my art teacher, like, do you consider Steven Spielberg an artist? She thought about it for a minute and was like, well, yeah, I guess so. And it's like, okay, well, I want to make a movie. And it's like, well, can, can you do that? Like, do you guys have, like, a video camera? And, and we did, and I was just going to do, like, a, a stop motion thing, and it wasn't anything super impressive. It was just kind of like a, a frog walking in and eating a fly. And then that was it. And, um, but it, it was cool just to do that. And uh, since I couldn't talk any of my friends into making a movie, because, like, YouTube didn't exist at that point, you know, now I'm dating myself. So, like, you couldn't, you can be like, look, no, I, I want to make a film. Like, you know, these guys kind of did. It's like, hey, I want to make a movie. You know, <laughs> I want like a porno. You know, I, if I had a nickel for every time I heard that, I'd have a lot of nickels, you know. But, uh so I started making movies with action figures, just being kind of a comic book freak and doing like, you know, Spider-Man versus Venom and, you know, just like real simple plots and there was really not much in the way of audio because nobody in the house would be quiet when you were filming, so you'd always get like weird things on the soundtrack and like people talking in the background. Going up, Brian. You want to see the fire for real. I do. What you Brain guys. Kiss my ass, man. I'll be having Eventually, I, I got smart enough to just plug like a stereo jack into the mic jack on the camera, and it was just like total silence, so I didn't have to worry about that anymore. You know, I had done enough of those, and I was in high school by that point, and I still wanted to make movies with people in it, but, you know, nobody was really hip to that, or I don't know if it was like performance anxiety, or nobody wanted to like be an actor. So, Mark and I had been buddies for forever, like back to junior high and he was like super huge into wrestling so he wanted someone to film these like backyard wrestling things that he put together that was a terrible phase of my life man i'm glad i'm i'm glad i did it in a way and i'm not with all the aches and pains i deal with these days anybody that says it's fake you're full of crap definitely real i don't know it's always kind of like uh you, you catch something on film, you know, and it's there forever. So all the aches and pains and everything, it's like I could sit there and tell somebody, oh, yeah, when I was young and stupid, I did this, or I could just show them the video and be like, check this shit out. So I started doing that, and we got a couple of those under our belt. And I didn't know anything about wrestling, and he didn't really know a lot about filmmaking, so we kind of like, you know, it, it was a good kind of trade-off because I learned a lot about stage fighting and, and then as, as the wrestling thing kind of went away um, and, you know, people just weren't around to do it anymore, I was like, 
yeah, let's let's make that movie we always talked about. So that's that's kind of how the ball got rolling on that. And that pretty much includes our lesson for the day. No, it's been a pleasure working with all. <laughs> Holy shit! With friends willing to help, now the question was, what kind of movie would they make? Skullface has a long and weird history, because like the first movie that we tried to make with them was, I, I mentioned we were in high school and we were just trying to make a slasher movie, because we thought, you know, like Scream was just hugely popular at the time, and we thought, you know, since most horror movies, it, it, it just seemed like really attainable, because they're all like kids in high school and we were in high school, so it's like, hey, maybe this is the thing that we could pull off. You would not believe how unhelpful, like, the teachers were, because it's just like, as soon as school was over, they wanted you out of there. It's like, don't hang around, don't loiter. Go out there and, you know, do your drugs or whatever, but you, you can't, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't shoot anything at the school, which really sucked, because, like, the whole plot centered around, <laughs> you know, being in high school, so... Basically, like all that stuff happened off the camera, and that, that was actually the first Skullface movie. Was uh, we, we kind of invented Skullface for that, and he just kind of continued to metamorphosize into whatever we needed him to be as, as the years went on. Yeah, I, I remember going round and round because like it was never written in the script like what he was supposed to be, and at the time it just like there were so many Scream clones coming out where it's like the only thing that was different was the mask and the weapon. And, yeah, you know, that's not exclusive to those movies. It was just kind of like slash, like cheap slasher movies in general. It's like, you just need a mask and a weapon. You know, we were like, whatever it is, the mask has to be great. <laughs> I used to work at Coney Island, 12 Mile and uh, Grosbeck. And uh, every day I'd get off work, I'd go next door to 7-Eleven and get a two liter of Mountain Dew and apple pie or whatnot. And I seen this skull mask and instantly I thought, this could be used in one of our films. He, he pulls this, this half mask out, and it was kind of cool, because like the old one was kind of a, like a humanoid bat, like a, like a human vampire bat. It was kind of goofy looking, but it was cool at the same time. Picked it up and showed it to uh, Solid, and he uh, thought we could use this. And there was something cool about it, but like by itself it didn't work, so that's when I, I kind of like put the ski mask on. It's like, okay, now it sort of looks like something, and, and then we got the hood, and it's now more like Grim Reaper-esque, and it's like, all right, that's the look. And before you know it, I'm chasing people with a knife with the skull mask on, trying to kill them. And it started off kind of trying to be scary, kind of like Scream-type movies. So we kind of continued to refine that over the years as we kept making movies because like at the time it just felt like not enough people had seen what we were doing. So if we kept kind of like remaking movie, the same movie, um, we could keep refining it and making it better. But then like there was no awareness of it. So there's no challenge to be like, hey, didn't you kids just do this like three weeks ago? And then it evolved into more of a comical type character, which I kind of like it as that. I think it was at Alice's house when we decided to do the uh, the comical thing with Skullface. Remember that? Where the lights went out and the lights turned on and Skullface is dragging somebody through the house and everyone's right. like, what happened? You know, they, no, like, Nobody sees him, but he's like right there. Pretty obvious. Uh, no, they say like you're the the scariest murderers and killers out there are the ones that look like you and I, like normal people. And I think with Skullface, he wasn't like he wasn't that overdone scary. He was like the perfect amount of like he could be anybody, and he just grabbed a mask, kind of like Michael Myers. Like he just like a normal guy or a normal guy, and they put a mask on, and that's that's scary because he doesn't want to show you who he is, and he's not overthinking it. He doesn't have to be too scary, and it's. It's the fact that it's just, it lets your mind wander of like what's behind the mask that's spooky. And it's like a simple face, it's a simple face. It's like, hmm, like it could be whatever you want, it's simple. So he kind of went from being like this Michael Myers type slasher to like a Grim Reaper type slasher 
to the where he wound up in like towards the murder before Christmas and that was the first one with the new mask because the original one didn't age well like I, I it was Mark's mask and he, he just let me hang on to it whenever we needed it but when it went back to him one time it just wound up being like on the dashboard of his truck for an entire summer just baking in the sun so he he came to visit me at college the one day and, and he hands me this like frisbee and he's just like you should probably hang on to this because we might need it again and I'm not taking good care of it and it's like oh my god like what happened to this thing so just over time from from the elements getting to it and uh from the age of the latex, it kind of completely dried out. And I was never able to track it down because like normally you go to like Halloween stores and you see kind of the same masks year after year and like there was no copyright on it, there was no date in it. It was just like some mysterious person put it in the 7-Eleven for Mark to find when we were in high school. <laughs> so I found a mask years later that, you know, looking at it, it, it had the same characteristics. It was a little more hardcore looking and that's the one that I have now. So it, it's still a Halloween store mask, but it's like been pretty heavily painted and modified so you couldn't just buy it off the shelf. It's always kind of a nice compliment too because people always ask me like, where did, where did that mask come from? Like, you know, so it, it, it kind of felt cool to have like the John Carpenter Halloween thing where they just sort of discovered a mask in a Halloween store and then changed it just enough to be its own thing. As many times as Skullface would resurface over the years, there was one film that the legendary villain didn't make the cut. The first one, Bloody End, was just like a pretty straight up, it was a slasher movie. Um, I regret not using Skullface in that one. And, and I, I tried to create a new killer that kind of didn't quite work. Just for whatever reason, I, I thought it would look better on camera than it did. But... Um, the reason I didn't use Skullface at the time for that was because he was more of a comedic character. You know, like we had made a couple of attempts at being serious with him, but then as time went on, he just kind of became a Looney Tunes character. And, you know, so, sort of like Deadpool is, where it's just like he's a living cartoon character and everybody else is actual people, so. Having tried their hand at horror, their next project would be something more heroic. Bombastic Entertainment is a very thin excuse to make movies, or <laughs> at least that's how it started out with, uh, you know, hey, let's let's make a horror movie, that'd be fun. Let's make an action movie. Uh, we, you know, we were playing GoldenEye, so we did like a series of like James Bond kind of movies. I don't know, like as far back as I can remember as I was a kid, you know, I've always been infatuated with action. Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, Rambo, Movies where stuff gets blown up. You've always been fascinated with uh, James Bond and whatnot, and so we've made spy movies. And of course, every uh, superhero movie needs a supervillain, and uh, who better than to die in one of your movies than me, right? Yeah, you know, not nearly anywhere as epic as like Raiders and what they were trying to do. But we also didn't have rich parents and mansions that we could like build sets in. If you remember, it started off in garages, uh, throwing a glass of muriatic acid at my friend Alex's face. And then you go to the next scene at somebody else's base, but it's really a garage, you know? It's funny to look back on those because it, it's not like, like I never went to Mark where it's like, I've got it. I've reinvented the story. You know, and <laughs> cause it was like the joke was almost that there was no joke. And we were doing like these James Bond movies, but it was just like in suburbia in someone's backyard. So it's like, oh, I'm saving the world, huh? And, and a small house in middle America. Yeah, okay, sure. And the next movie we did, like, we had actual offices and buildings we went to and stuff. And... But it always looked strange when we did have a good location because like, there was like a mansion in Grand Rapids that I somehow managed to talk our way into filming at. So whenever we did have a good location, it just it made it, that whole thing even weirder where it's just like nothing, like what world does this take place in? It was pretty cool, you know, just how we've evolved and... We, we did some fun stuff on those. You started planning more and thinking more and putting more into it. And... 
It was good thinking, good creativeness. After making several movies featuring the same small group of people, it wasn't long before a pattern began to emerge. Way back in the beginning, when we first started making movies, uh, I always wound up being the good guy because nobody wanted to be the good guy, everybody wanted to play the villain. My father was an actor. I didn't really get to know him too well, but he always played the bad guy in whatever he was in. And he wasn't like that in real life, but he played the guy you love to hate, usually, in every, everything he did. He didn't do movies, though. He did, like, stage acting, stuff like that. Mark always wound up being the villain, so it always kind of became this expected thing where it's like, you know, Brian's the good guy, Mark's the bad guy. I don't mind. I, uh, of course, I'm not in real life, so I figured it'd be a challenge to play a character that maybe somebody would hate. And there, there's a couple movies where, you know, we try and dress it up in different ways where, like, you know, he'll be wearing, like, a ski mask and he'll be playing, like, several different characters. World Beyond Tomorrow. I played the two main bad guys. <laughs> I played the carnivore. The guy doesn't speak. All you see is his eyes. And then I played a blind guy with a blindfold on, so you see everything else. And it was interesting. Plus, I played all the goons with the ski masks and the scuba gear on and all that stuff. And well, I mean, that one movie alone, there's at least six times where Mark gets killed in it. I got the martini mixer chucked at my face. Got drowned and... See you back at the dock. So I probably died like 18 times in that movie. <laughs> I just hope that looked good. That looks spectacular. Uh, I was watching it. Your feet, you're like five feet. Everything, yeah, that was good. That was, that was beautiful. You know, you die well. You know, you do all that stuff good, Mark. You know. Oh, Thank you. shit. I've never done an official count on it. I, I probably should do that at some point. I think that'd be a lot of fun. That's That must be why I'm so nice all the time, is I just get it all out on, I just take it all out on Mark and, I'm like a freaking cat, man. I got more than nine lives. Like a cockroach, a cucarache. Post-apocalypse. Nuke them and they just keep coming back. And actually when we were filming uh, Rise of the Dead, I was hoping that you know if we ever made a zombie movie, like since we use the same actors all the time, it would be cool to have the zombies be characters who got killed in our previous movies. And the problem with that was that every almost every character who died was usually Mark, just, just through circumstance. You know, so, but, but I did manage to sneak a couple of those characters in there, um, like Cole from Severance Package. You can see him walking out in the field. Um, Dan from uh, one, one of the early Skullface movies, he got stabbed in the back, and he's a zombie walking around with a knife in his back in that movie. The carnivore is in that from our James Bond 008 epic movies, so um, not as many as I would have liked, but, you know, un unfortunately, Mark was the main character in that one, so we couldn't really have him playing, like, every single zombie in the movie, or it would have just turned into, like, the Agent Smith fight in The Matrix. You know, there's some misconception, like, well, maybe it's not a misconception, maybe it's just something my dad likes to give me crap about, that, you know, Mark and I must have some kind of contentious relationship because he keeps getting murdered repeatedly. That's how you know you're doing your job right, I guess. It's not true. It's just, he always wants to be the bad guy, and the bad guys usually die. Having firmly found his footing as a filmmaker, Brian would soon discover he wasn't the only person running around Michigan with a movie camera. Blood Siblings was a, uh, a creation of my brother, Rick, and a couple of his buddies. Uh, but Blood Siblings was basically the story of a, uh, a brother and sister, twins. The sister had murdered the, the mother years earlier, and she uh, ended up in a mental hospital. And uh, from there, when the brother goes to uh, pick her up for her release, um, well, everything kind of takes a turn. So a friend of a friend 
his relatives were were making this movie called Blood Siblings, and it was I, I didn't know anything about it. All I knew was they needed an editor. And we were hanging out at the bar one night. And he's, it comes up. It's like, oh, well, you're an editor. Like, why don't I put you in touch with these guys? Me and Kevin were sitting in my living room one day, and I was telling them the story about Blood Siblings and how we were having a little bit of an issue with the editing process. And he goes, oh, I, well, you know what? You should call my buddy up. My buddy, uh, my buddy Brian. I'm like, Brian? He's like, yeah, my buddy. You know, he uh, he does that that kind of stuff. So that was kind of neat um, because I got a chance to edit a feature film, which you know doesn't come along every day, and they actually shot the thing on film. From there, I think the movie got turned over to you, and you turned it into a masterpiece. <laughs> well, as much of a masterpiece as Blood Siblings could have been. You know. It was a little rough around the edges, but you know it was a fun experience to just work on someone else's project as an editor and not see the thing like I always do when I'm putting my own stuff together. Because like when I'm shooting something, I'm kind of editing in my head as I go along, so I know what we need, when we need it, where we need it. And it was really cool to kind of discover someone else's film through the editing that way. That was fantastic. It was awesome. It was cool. It was unique. It was neat to see that old school camera with the big reels. And the only problem was is that you had no idea what you just filmed. So you would have to send it out, wait three or four months, get it back, and then look at it and be like, oh, yeah, we missed that. The movie, like they tried to submit it to festivals and I don't think it went very far, but um, I wound up becoming friends with all those guys just by proxy. So like other Brian was the main actor in that. No, actually I had got a call from my brother Rick. He's like, hey, do you want to be in a movie? And I said, sure. What am I doing? He's like, oh, you're going to be a deputy. You know, so the first day of shooting, uh, I'm on set and I'm, uh, I play the deputy. I'm in, you know, in the deputy car and say the deputy lines. And you know, it was about an hour, hour and a half, but I was there for probably eight. And uh, about a day or two later, I get a frantic call from my brother telling me that the lead actor quit. And uh, I said, well, hey, I'll do it. Oh, I don't know. Well, you have to, you'll have to audition for it. Okay, well, let's go. Let's audition. So I read for the part of Miles, and lo and behold, I became Miles Banyan of Blood Siblings. A lot of those people, like Richard LaValle and John Desi and, and Brian Wisman, kind of got folded into what I was doing. Because even though it was on a smaller scale, like they, they spent like twenty, thirty thousand dollars on this thing, whereas I think every movie I've ever made probably cost a total of twenty thousand dollars cumulatively. But uh, yeah, so you know it, it was neat, and then you know that that's a good example though of like you know never underestimate the value of making friends with people and not being a jerk, and you know that really paid dividends because those guys have been great and they've been helping me for the last 10 years on everything I've done since then. With Blood Siblings released to the world, the growing Bombastic crew would focus their attention on a new series of movies. After Rise of the Dead, I kind of took a break from making movies for a while because it, I, I felt like I was at a point where I'm good enough to get paid to do this, so I want to try and find money to do it. And sadly, it's just, I don't know if there's just too many people making movies or what the deal is, but like finding, you know, someone to pay you to make your own stuff is surprisingly difficult. Um, you know, so I, I did plenty of work for other people, but after a steady diet of like, you know, just kind of corporate gigs and things like that, it was like, you know, I really want to make movies again. I had so much fun, you know, in Blood Siblings. It was it was an experience. I got to learn a lot of of the behind the scenes things and that <clears throat> one typically doesn't understand when watching a movie. You know, you, you don't realize how much movie magic there truly is in a movie until you've actually sat behind the camera or off on the side of the screen and watched the action take place. And then when you see it all come together, you're like, "But wait, ah, uh, uh, okay." You know, it, it was really cool to see that aspect. So, yeah, I was interested and curious to do a little bit more. And But, yeah, Brian, you know, had, had mentioned he had some uh, some projects coming up, and I piqued a little bit of interest. And uh, one day he calls me up and says, hey, meet me over at Mark's house because we were going to film a, a short improv uh, of, of film, and I had no idea what it was going to be. So, yeah, we... Uh, we filmed the body. I had some ideas, but I didn't write any of the scripts for them. 
So like the body was an improvised movie where we had a concept and I just kind of like talked the actors through it and we all sort of just improv that movie as it went along. We got to you pretty much use our imagination as far as, you know, where we went, as far as dialogue went. And, you know, Brian uh, didn't like something he told you. Hey, wait, hold on, well, why don't we try this? Okay. Uh, wait, I want you to take a step slightly to your right, Mark. Slightly. There. And... Action. That looks so bad. <laughs> How many times has that happened to you? It, it came out. Uh, it came out really well. It was fun, and then again from there it just kept going. You know, Brian, when's the next? Uh, when's the next script coming out? When, what, what, what are we filming next? You know, where are we going? What are we gonna do? At the same time the body was filming, Brian would experiment with a different kind of improv making a movie without actors, completely filming and performing an entire movie by himself. But my favorite overall thing that I've ever seen from Bombastic Entertainment is the, uh, is the special effects fun house. The haunting permit was started out as like a visual effects test. And I was like, I, I just kept adding and adding and adding to that. And then eventually cobbling a, a loose narrative together. And, you know, somehow that became a movie by its own. The haunting permit, that is by far and will ever be my number one favorite thing that Brian has ever made that I am not in. <laughs> Let's see. Electricians, excavating engravers. Aha! Exorcisticians! Well, I've watched that a million times, and there's still things that I... I refuse to ask him how he did because I don't want to know. I think there's one shot in that movie that I couldn't physically do by myself. But we got this, man. We got this by the ass. But it, that's one of my favorite things that I, I have ever seen. And that was, you know, before my time he made that. But it was awesome. It was uh, probably one of the best things as far as uses of special effects or teetering or toying with special effects to come up with... Uh, with that kind of an idea and, and to implement some of the things he did in that was, that's, that's by far my favorite thing he's ever made. Encouraged by the success of these improv films, Bombastic's next movie, Starecrow, would remain unscripted but not completely improvised. Starecrow was, uh, you know, kind of in that vein, but that was at least storyboarded, because being that there's really no, not a lot of dialogue in that one, it just seemed like a waste to write a script for that. If you get out to change the tire, look around, make sure there's not a scarecrow sitting there looking at you, because it could be your last day on Earth. And that would suck. What the hell are you looking at? So once again, I just kind of like talked to everybody through what was going on and I had the storyboards of it. So the whole thing was uh, drawn out beforehand and people could kind of see like, oh, so that's sort of what it means. What, you know, it's more about the using editing to comment on things than using dialogue to drive the plot on. You know, my kid still talks about how my head is in the parking lot. My six-year-old, daddy's head is in the parking lot. Yeah, my mom showed him that. Oh! Three twenty-three to five eighty-four. Five. Adam Young, nineteen fifty-five. She didn't okay. maybe think that. Hey, yeah, a five-year-old probably shouldn't see this because he doesn't realize the fact that it's just a movie. After production, the Starecrow would find new life off-screen as Mark would take the costume and terrorize neighborhood trick-or-treaters on Halloween night. Hell yeah, I did. Yeah. I scared the shit out of some kids. I had a girl kick me in the face one time. It was awesome. Yeah, I built a giant cross that 
I could hang from. And the kids had to kind of get through me to get their candy. Some of them did, and some of them just kept walking. They didn't want anything to do with it. It was awesome. Blending the special effects improv of Haunting Permit and the more structured nature of Staircrow, Brian would dream up his most ambitious improv project to date. Catalyst was sort of in that same vein. There was no script for that one. Like, it was all improvised. <laughs> that one was kind of a humdinger because, like, you know, you, you've got this character who doesn't exist and you have to kind of, like, talk, mark through what's going on. Well, the people at the park thought I was on LSD because I'm running from nothing. You know, one of the reasons why Mark and I work so well together is, like, he trusts me. So, like, when we do the play fighting stuff, like, it always turns out really good because... It's like having a good dance partner. You know the other person's looking out for you and not going to step on your toes. And it's kind of the same thing with the visual effects stuff where, you know, he knows I'm not going to make him look stupid. I just had all my wisdom teeth pulled out, and my mouth was killing me. And then we get to the part where uh, Brian's like, okay, the, uh, this is the part where the robot hits you. You have to fall down. I'm like, fall down? <laughs> wait, 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 what? It's like, yeah, the robot hits you and you got to fly back and land on your back. I'm like, oh, uh, my mouth is just killing me. Like, pain meds were wearing off. Like, everything was just sucky. So I was like, all right, fine. Do it once. Ah, we're going to have to do another and do it again. Ah, sell it this time real good. Just make it look real good. Like, okay, I'm dying here. And then, you know, you got people all around you just looking at us because they're like, what the fuck is this guy doing? Like, like oh, there's, there's an invisible robot there, guys. You just don't see him. But he's there, I assure you. The first time that I actually got to collaborate with Brian was on Catalyst, and I didn't actually get to go and film any of the acting. It was just, uh, we had to take these uh, photospheres for you know, 360 degree photos so that he could map these things onto the carcass of this CG robot that he was going to create. And I, I didn't even want to take my brain there. Like I can't even imagine how many hours in front of the computer that was going to take. And it, it must have been even longer than I could have imagined because I want to say it was another year and some change before I actually got to see the finished product. But that's, that's definitely uh, shows you the kind of hard work and dedication that went into that. I don't know. I mean, they're, they're kind of fun experiments. I haven't really tried to, like, put another one of those together. But um, sometimes you just get, like, an idea for something, and you're just so excited about the idea of the thing that you just want to forge ahead making that. So hopefully, you know, if there's cracks in those movies, they don't show too much that, you know, there was a lack of a script that we just kind of, like, you know, that's kind of how we did it back in high school, too. So every once in a while, it's kind of fun to sort of, like, go back to your roots with all the technological advances of, like, 3D animation and stuff like that that you can kind of, like, layer in there and try and do things the old way with modern conceits. Approaching the 10-year anniversary of Bombastic Entertainment, Brian would attempt a production on a larger scale than anything that had come before all stuffed into a single garage in the middle of suburbia. I read that thing I play a, a, a vampire. No, but it was fun. It was a great experience. Again, I got to work with Mark Pappas. Um, you know, he played opposite me, the uh, brother of the vampire who was now trying to kill me, um, but failing. And uh, Brian amazingly built a set in a garage, um, complete with dirt, tombstones, branches, foliage. It was, uh, it was something else. He walked in into that garage and one half of it was a garage and the other half was a completely different world. It was amazing. And we transitioned from the graveyard to a, to a crypt um, that he entirely built himself out of, out of foam insulation. And uh, it was probably one of the coolest things that I had seen in the, such a small space, because it was in the same space as the, uh, as the graveyard. And uh, again, you know, it was walking into a garage and one half, and then boom, you were in a crib, and it just felt like you were really in a crib. It was, it was really good. It was well-constructed, and it looked fantastic on film. Uh, but that was fun. I mean, we had a lot of fun 
in that, like I said, I played a vampire and I, uh, I was in a coffin in the crypt, you know, just covered in a crypt, <laughs> waiting for something to happen on the outside. <laughs> Yeah, what are they saying? Did they say action? I can't hear a thing. I vole to buy Joe Mac. He's been saving that for seven months. <laughs> Brian Whispered, ladies and gentlemen. He's here all night. Be sure to tip your waiters and waitresses. <laughs> that was the first time I was ever beheaded. Um, and that was probably my favorite scene to film. Um, I'm not going to give away any of the details, but uh, it, it was cool to see how how to behead someone on film. <laughs> you know, it, it, it worked in, in the, 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 the trick, or I don't want to use maybe the word trick, but uh, the way he constructed the, that, uh, that scene was, was brilliant and it worked to perfection. Um, we, had, we had a lot of laughs after that happened on that. <laughs> that was a good night. Since we kind of did a, a vampire one, I wanted to do a, a Frankenstein one because I just I love the, the crude sense of science in those movies, and it's just something that like works so well in that Victorian era, like in that heartbeat before medical science actually became sophisticated. They really were kind of like butchers, and that's actually how it came from the garage. We kind of like stumbled on making that movie, like the idea for that, because like everybody was busy at the time. So it's like, you know, do I have to grow an actor to get a movie made? <laughs> so that's kind of how I came up with the whole like mad scientist thing. I was trying to write a spiritual successor to the redeadening because that was kind of more like Hammer, Dracula, Universal, monster movies kind of thing with like all the fog and all the blood. So the fog was like the Universal influence, the blood was like the Hammer influence. But, you know, I wasn't going to build sets on it. so. Setting it in the garage kind of lent the whole like reanimator vibe to it, and the whole thing just like gelled beautifully. Connecting with an audience is at the heart of the movie experience, and the advent of video sharing sites made finding an audience much easier than anyone could have imagined. It would even spawn a new genre of storytelling, one in which the audience becomes an active participant. After YouTube came around, I had gotten enough comments on people, because Rise of the Dead was the first movie that I put on YouTube. I wish I had put it on a lot sooner. I'm, I'm really bad with like newer technology, with just like ignoring it to death, and then finally it's like, no, 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 you have to get on this YouTube thing. Because like for the first time, it's not just your friends watching movies, or you know, people that kind of have to be polite because you're in the room. It's like the internet, so people will just say like the worst things that they possibly can. And it's just like, you know, it, okay, I'm, you know, it's too bad. I really like that movie that you made, you know, because it, like with Rise of the Dead, they'd, they'd be like, you know, well, that movie was stupid. I'd have been driving around with my AR-15 and my monster truck. And, and it's like, okay, well, the problem with what you're saying is it's not a story. So I thought it would be kind of a fun experiment to kind of like put that control in the viewer's hands. And then, you know, the classic mold for that is like a choose your own adventure book. I used to love, everybody used to love those as a kid. I don't know if they still have those, but it'd be like, you know, turn to page 80 to jump out of the airplane or turn to page 90 to try and land it yourself. He does try to, uh, to put something on that screen that's going to entertain pretty much anybody, you know? I mean, he's done some amazing things with interactive shorts that I would have never Never have guessed, you know, that he could pull off, but he's done some just absolutely phenomenal things. Something like it came from the garage. We've all seen, you know, the, the creature feature with the monster that gets loose because the mad scientist, you know, is thinking with his, uh, it's the Jeff Goldblum quote from, from Jurassic Park, you know. Spend all this time wondering whether or not you could, you didn't stop to think if you should. But when it's, put together in such a way where like clearly the, the the handmade aesthetic is part of the charm and then you split it up into a choose your own adventure story. That was always kind of a fun challenge writing because you would try 
I, I would try desperately to make what people didn't see as good as what they did see. And then, you know, it, it, it kind of sucks to, to the point where, you know, some people would only go through it once and be like, ooh, finished, you know. But then other people would actually go back and, like, watch through all the scenarios and actually find little things that they didn't see in other ones. And so that was always cool. I continue the research. You know, and then playing with the narrative of that, because like the first one, Bloody End, was just like a pretty straight up, it was a slasher movie. So trying to play with the narrative of those, some a little more successful than others, like It Came From The Garage was only different because the premise was so different. It's reanimator with a kick. You know, you were still playing as a character trying to escape something, it's just that you were playing from this really weird perspective and it, it was almost kind of like this live action, you know, Donald Duck versus Chippendale kind of situation where like how much chaos can this tiny creature create? Good good Uncle Solid humor. It came from the garage. He's got the eye patch on so you know it was his eye. When the there's one part where the creature gets killed by a paint can. Come on, it's okay. Come on man. Come on out little finger puppet creature man. Ah damn it! Some lady in the audience screamed. <laughs> it's like, ah, good, my cheap tricks work. But that same moment, Mark and his son were watching it at their house, and then they wound up laughing so loud and so hard that his wife, I don't think they'll mind me telling the story, she came in the room and got mad at him. It's like, what are you guys watching? Like, why are you laughing so hard? When that little hand with the eyeball on it was jumping around, dude, we were cracking up watching that. That was hilarious. But that's why Easy Money was so cool, was because like, you had basically two completely different movies, because you, you had characters that had a disagreement, and then depending on who you sided with, the other person became the bad guy, and two different movies played out. Yeah, that one was cool. We uh, both kind of killed the shit out of each other multiple times in that movie. Felt pretty good. <laughs> ah, oh. That one was an uh, interesting storyline. Um, you know, just, we were out there in the woods doing our thing and improvising a lot as we went, trying to find location stuff. Um, it was my first time ever pulling a tick out of my leg, so that was cool. <laughs> yeah, just uh, the multiple uh, death scenes that we did were you make the wrong choice and your character dies. So we got to do multiple death scenes. It was like Mortal Kombat, but for real, you know. So I'd, I'd like to make some more of those. Um, I, I just kind of haven't got back to it yet. With the potential to reach a virtual global audience, the internet would also open up new ways of interacting with live audiences in a traditional theater setting. So back in the early days when we were shooting everything on VHS, you kind of, people would ask about how the movie turned out or, you know, how's the movie going. And at the time, I just sort of have the VHS tapes in my trunk, so I'd pull them, go to Rustine and just pull the copy of the movie out, put it in. So it's just kind of like you and your friends, and then you know, as years went by, there were like different film festivals that popped up that you could access because of the internet and so now you've got an opportunity to see your movie with a live audience which is really cool that don't know you and don't have to be nice to you so you can really gauge like how genuine those reactions are. The Reed Deadening was the first one to, to, to play at the Mitten Movie Projects. Oh, those are the days. Deadening. I also played the priest character. I, I look a little different because I don't have a beard and I'm in color.
against your brother? He was adopted. <laughs> Somebody came in here, there really would be no logical explanation for what we have just done. We're gonna get lynched. That's one way of looking at it. <laughs> so, what's the other one? <laughs> you know, see, the Bible, right? It teaches us that. Um, It's cool seeing people that I don't know's reactions, you know, because anytime you you sit down with your family and you're like, hey, check out this movie we just made, and they're watching it, and they always tell you good job afterwards. You know, it's like, oh yeah, that was great, good job. It's like, but was it really? There's there's nothing like it, you know, to, to sit back there and, and kind of watch the reaction of the crowd as as you know <clears throat> they're watching you on the screen. It's a humbling experience, you know, you. You, you, you kind of just, you, know, you don't take it for granted. You, you enjoy the moment. You know, it's not going to last forever, but that moment is, is really cool. You know, to, to be 15 feet tall and, and just look up at yourself and go, wow, that's me. You know, it's, it's, it's really cool. You, you know your movie works if total strangers come up to you afterwards and say, you know, hey, that was really cool. Because if you're good at something, you tell people. When you're really good at something, people tell you. And I've, I've always used that as kind of a litmus test of, you know, whether or not did this thing actually work. Like, did you get the laugh? Did you get the scream? You know, but it, it's always really flattering because people don't go out of their way to give you compliments either. They'll go out of their way to tell you you're a horrible person, but, you know, to say nice things, we can't do that. Mark just brought up, brought up a great point, is that we're, we're in a bad position to be in if people start throwing tomatoes. And, and I don't have a hood. <laughs> it's like the ultimate test. You know, like, you're sitting out there in, in the theater and you just hear people's comments all around you. That's cool, man. Everybody's a critic. Part of me's waiting for the, uh, man, that guy sucks. I could turn around and punch him right in the mouth or something, you know. But, but you use it to better yourself and say, okay, well, we shouldn't have done that that way. Next time we know. There, there was kind of a botched screening that we had of Bloody End because the lady who was curating the event didn't let the audience go through the whole movie. They, they made it so far they got killed. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's it. They start rolling the next movie. The audience booed her to death. And I, even though I was angry that they didn't get to see the rest of the movie because it keeps, it kept progressively getting cooler, I felt really glad because it, it's like they felt cheated. 
because they didn't get to see how that plays out. So they were there, they were in it, we had them. Because like that, that reaction was like better than a standing ovation because like, you know, they were gonna burn the place down because they didn't get to see the end of it. <laughs> like at some of these local festivals, if you do them enough, you, you meet people who you keep running into and then, you know, maybe become friends with and then maybe you wind up suckering them into helping you along with some of this crazy stuff. Well, in 2008, I met a guy named Terrence Pop, who at the time was uh, fresh off a divorce and about 20 years into the Army. And he wanted to have a dramatic film made about uh, experiences that he had witnessed firsthand. It hadn't really happened to him, but he saw the dark road that that could go down. So I made it, showed it to a friend of mine who knew the curator of the Mitten Movie Project, and she was like, you know, this is really good. You should think about screening it at this film festival. I'm like, all right, sure. So I did. And uh, I want to say it was probably that same year, maybe a month or two after my first film screened, that I saw this comedic horror film called Rustine. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh, okay. Seeing the liner notes or the uh, like, just the program notes, I knew what I could expect. I was like, okay, well, the guy's obviously a John Carpenter fan. I'm probably going to like this. But it was when, probably just a few minutes into the film, and all of a sudden, a fucking box pops up in the corner of the screen in a reference to Castlevania II and says, what a horrible night for a curse. And I was like, okay, i got to find out who this guy is because <laughs> I think we could be friends. This answers just as many questions as it raises. I remember meeting Mr. Brian at the Man Movie Projects. It's fun because I had been to a few where I actually saw him there and then we had a competition and ironically enough, it was a film that I had before I even went into film school that I made. And I actually took first place that night. But my greatest fear was losing to Rustine. My best friend and I, every time we see each other, every now and again, I'll just look at her and I'll say something along the lines of, you dick, you got acid on my car. She'll snicker and in a redneck voice say, you got car in my acid. But when I met Brian that night, the first thing that he says is, I've done over a hundred short films and I've been doing this forever. And I'm like, me too, but I don't think I counted. And it was just fun. He's a cool dude, got to work with him beyond that and built a great friendship as far as that goes. Sure enough, that night, you know, talked to Brian over at Mr. B's and uh, we had a lot of common interests. We, we, we liked the same kind of movies and I was hoping that somewhere down the line we'd be able to work together. It took a long time, but eventually we got there. Emboldened by reaching a new audience, Brian would look to the past to find ways of breathing fresh life into older movies. Twas the Murder Before Christmas was actually part of a joke trailer we did for another movie, which, which was New Year's Evil, which at the time I didn't know there was a movie called New Year's Evil. I was just trying to think of the most ridiculous holiday-themed, you know, slasher movies that I could. From the creators of Twas the Murder Before Christmas and It's My Party and You'll Die If I Want You To. Because like a, a few years went by and I wanted to make a Christmas movie of some sort. I don't know why. It's just like, I haven't made a Christmas movie. Let's, let's make a Christmas movie. And the first thing that popped into my mind was Twas the Murder Before Christmas. And I, I thought, you know, this is actually a good opportunity because none of our Skullface films from high school and college are on the internet. So it's kind of a blank slate. We can kind of like put them back out there. And that was the great thing about that character is he can kind of be whatever you need him to be. So he's definitely very much a goofball in that. Being that we live in Michigan, for example, playing the carnivore in a suit on a hot summer day really sucked ass. Asshole recording <laughs> all this. Bitch. But playing Skullface in wintertime was actually somewhat nice. Everybody's freezing their balls off, and here's old Skullface with a mask on, a nice coat, and gloves, and everything. And it was nice. You know, that, that was the first movie with the new mask in there. And then we kind of got rid of like the old Grim Reaper suit and then for Soul Survivors, it was kind of like a reintroduction to him because all the guy, I, I like that like there's a very loose connective mythology to it because originally the kid from Twisted Murder Before Christmas was going to be in Soul Survivors. 
is kind of like a Tommy Jarvis character who came back years and years later. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. My kid still talks about that. No! Because if you follow that story through to its natural conclusion, like Skullface kills somebody and then steals all the presents at the guy's house, and then like this little kid sees him and thinks it's Santa Claus, so he just kind of leaves the presents there, and the next day the police would show up because they're investigating a murder scene, and then they have to repossess all the presents because it's part of a murder, and so that's how the kid finds out that there's no Santa Claus. <laughs> So I like that even a perceived act of kindness is even kind of twisted just because it's coming through Skullface. So he would have come back as kind of like a Tommy Jarvis character, but I, I don't know. It's just It was too much to pack in to Soul Survivors the way that it was. So we kind of went with like, you know, a, a whole new cast. And, you know, the idea with that one was just that you take all the survivors of a particular serial killer, like, like a Jason Voorhees type killer, and then put them in a room together and they all start telling their stories, like, how did he almost get you? And then, you know, you, you kind of have like the expendables of, of a horror movie version. And it's just like, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good idea. No one's done that before. I need a slasher killer. Well, you know, we got Skullface, so let's, uh, <laughs> let's get him back out there. I, I do love the, uh, the Skullface character. It's, uh, it's interesting, you know? You don't usually see too many comical killers like that. With the 20th anniversary of Bombastic Entertainment approaching, 20 years of making films was about to come full circle. The first movie we tried to make was, was a Skullface movie. And I realized that that would be the last movie that I would have the chance to make before the 20 year anniversary kind of hit. So I thought, okay, you know, here's a good opportunity to, you know, not only bring back Skullface, but like in a modern way to kind of illustrate like how much we've grown as filmmakers over this time. Soul Survivors was uh, different. It was cool. I liked meeting new people. We had actors that wanted to help us with the movie and stuff. So I got to meet some cool people and then chase them around with a knife. Not to fluff Brian's feathers, but my favorite part, I really liked how Soul Survivors came together. So even with production and putting it together, it ended and came together really seamlessly. I think everybody had their, had their fun with, uh, with Danielle on the set of that movie. She, was, uh, she, kind of, she kept the energy level pretty high in between takes because she was always cracking jokes and just kind of enjoying herself. Grace? You're so graceful. <laughs> Is, <laughs> I thought you were, I hope that was a good shot because this ton's done for right now, right? Oh my gosh, all right. See, but it was nice though, because all of us got, we all of us did get along from what I remember, but, and it was, even though it was cold and late and dark, aside from the lights, it, we still had fun. Like we had a lot of fun on set. And I think, again, that goes back to what I said earlier. It's fun when you get to meet new people and work with people and everyone gets along together. Uh, I, can, I remember uh, <laughs> uh, sitting out in the woods and it was cold too for being in a cold atmosphere <laughs> for the scene we shot. It was very nice to know we need this, 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 and this, let's get it done. So, and I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Plus it was fun to be freezing to death and just to act like it's a casual day that you're camping. So it's fine. <laughs> I think it had gotten so cold that the dew began to freeze on the, on the grass and the foliage in the area because it was about 1 in the morning, 1.30 in the morning, and we were about to light off three airsoft grenades in some random backyard and someplace in Michigan. <laughs> That's so close.
when you can keep people happy when they're when everything's going over schedule, then you know that you're on the set of something that's uh, going to come together pretty well. It smells nice. And then everybody was just kind of working together. We had friends and family that let us do our thing at their houses and their backyards and stuff. And pictures. Yeah, we got, we got. Mark. Yeah, we're you good. are a star. Should be enough motivation. Come on, Lugain, it's out of cool. the, the second night was. <laughs> it was hilarious because my wife was in my house. We're up on the roof filming, which started later than we wanted to because. Uh, we didn't have a ladder equipped for the occasion, so we had to run out, grab a ladder, come back, finally get everybody up on the roof and start filming this thing. We're all stumbling around up there, and my wife is inside the house trying to balance her fear of me being, you know, 15 feet above the pavement with her annoyance that all you can hear is <laughs> on the roof of the house, and we have a, a kid who's trying to sleep. I'm, I'm a good friend. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> I wouldn't... Uh... <laughs> I wouldn't have traded that one, especially because I think all of us had the same heart attack moment at the exact same time when we finally unloaded this can of silly string into Mark's face and he starts stumbling backwards. And at one point, I think I actually kind of blew the end of the shot because he started to stumble so realistically, I, w I just went <laughs> just to check and make sure he wasn't actually going to fall off the roof. Silly strings, all right? Silly strings, great. He needs me to get thrown off a roof. Uh, maybe about 20 years ago, I'd have been like, yeah, sure, I gotta go to work tomorrow, so. He's a crazy man, folks. Ah, this thing is harder than hell, dude. I thought it would give. <laughs> I ain't give a shit. <laughs> Woo! But I kind of included like all the best gags over the years of different things that I did because like we've got sparklers as a visual effect. <laughs> it's one of the dumbest things we've ever done, Brian. You know, it's this three dollar effect that looks like a million bucks just because you're you're utilizing it the right way. Uh, you guys are gonna. Laugh at me, it's so stupid. But, but I mean, you don't think the, the whole sparkler one was one I didn't anticipate until, uh, you know, that I didn't. Well, who am I kidding? Of course, it was going to come off well on film. <laughs> Everything he does happens to just emulate on film. The, the big explosion I created for Rise of the Dead, we redid that in the pool scene with uh, Maria. It, it, from the smallest of intricate things to the biggest fireballs from creamer out of coffee, you know? I mean, it's he comes up with some just crazy ideas to make things work, and they work. Because there were days that I was just Brian and I shooting, and we were doing trick photography, where we set up a shot where the guy is running in place, and that translated very well. Then when he got stabbed to death, and we just stabbed into a bucket of blood, that was hilarious. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we Bloody killed fish. the Pantene bottle. <laughs> I don't know, just everything that we did together was fun. I don't think we've had a special effect that he concocted fail epically. Every one of them have pretty much come across just as planned. We had a brief underwater scene, which we had did years and years ago in one of the James Bond movies. That was an interesting day. It was, uh, like I said, some friends and family. We were all just kind of doing our thing behind the scenes. And, uh... and then you're off. Perfect. <laughs> exactly. Do exactly that. I rolled on that. How do you want me to do the grill? Oh, <laughs> You're dead, huh? I got that barbecue explosion in my face and then got knocked into the water. That was 
pretty cool. It was one of those, you gotta get it right on the first try things, and I think we got it right. I think the best thing that I learned on the set of Soul Survivors is that if you can have a nicely lit swimming pool in a, in a nice suburban neighborhood at night, you can make e even the, uh, the lowest budget independent film look like a million bucks, because that was great. And uh, of course, at the beginning, when it started raining, we were all kind of pissed off, like, damn it, it's freaking raining, we want to shoot this movie. But it turned out to be serendipitous, because when we actually went to go and shoot over by the pool, we had all this beautiful steam, which would have cost probably a couple hundred dollars in dry ice in order to achieve, and it's just coming off there nice and organically, I'm like, okay, this is, this is good, this looks fantastic, we can work with this. But a lot went into it. It worked out. The water was all foggy and stuff, and... It's just like a perfect night for it. That was cool to, to not only thematically have like this 20 year movie, but to do all the same things that we had done over the years. It was kind of like a whole like kitchen sink approach. He has come so far in, in the last 10 years and, and it makes me so happy to see it because he deserves it. You know, he's put a lot of hard work into these things and he, he does try to, uh, to put something on that screen that's going to entertain pretty much anybody. You know, the neat thing about that is that people don't have to know anything about us to enjoy it because you just see the thing and it works for what it is, which in my opinion is always the best kind of in-joke because a thing works on multiple levels where if, if you know about it, it'll be a little bit of a richer experience, but if you don't know anything, you can still get it. That's good stuff. But it's always a good time when, when you're working with, uh, with Brian because he's always so, so professional. He's always, he knows what he wants. When you get there, he's like, okay, here's what we're doing. We're going to be here, we're going to be here, and we're going to be here. And boom, 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 and it works like, it, it, it's clockwork. One of the nice things about working with, uh, with Brian on these films is that he's, he's got his vision. He knows exactly what he wants. And I think... Steve McLaren at one point when we were filming said, you know, that's just half the battle, man, because he's, he's worked with so many people who just, uh, I think quite a few of them at this point are probably on his beat on sight list. Well, to be honest, I've worked with a lot of different Michigan filmmakers and a lot of different Michigan directors. Uh, the majority of directors I've worked with, I can't stand them because they're all fucking idiots. And I mean that in the kindest way, but... When they develop their product, they don't pre-plan, they don't have storyboards, they don't have an idea, a shot list, they just go and they're like, yeah, and then they're going to do this. What do you think? How should we do this? Do you think this is a good idea? I'm like, this is your movie. You're supposed to have this all set. With Brian's product and see similar with Steve's, which is why I enjoyed working with Brian, is because he has everything laid out when you get there. Um, you have the, this is the scenes we need, this is the shots, this is what I envision, and I really like that. I don't like the whole on the fly, oh, let's just run and let's do this. And, and it wasn't hard to work with him. He was really humble, and that made the project a lot easier to deal with. Because the problem that you run into in any type of independent production is a lot of people are arrogant and they think that they have all the answers for everything. He was very open, he made the product great, the environment fun, and it was just a good time. Just having somebody who knows what he wants and actually understands the mechanics of how to get it there, and yet is still open to other people's ideas and incorporating them in. Because I remember on the last day of shooting when we were at uh, the house with all the actors, Brian had an idea for the last shot of, of how it should look, and I was like, you know, I think it would look really cool if we had like this super fast like dolly track out, and he's like, make it happen, you know. I'm going to go put the costume on. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Let's try this out. And it's, it's the shot that's in the movie. <laughs> when I tell people about that movie, I was like, yeah, I actually got to direct the last shot of the film. It was actually pretty cool. So I enjoyed that very much. And with Skullface, it, The Soul Survivors, when I read it, it was very interesting to know that we, even though we were the survivors, we, we weren't really. It was like a, a booby trap on top of a booby trap, and I really liked that. So it was, it was cool that the skull face won in the end. So I was really happy with it because the villain got the last laugh, and I like those. 
Unlike Skullface, when a vehicle became a recurring character itself, a different kind of legend was born. The Grand Dam being in every single film I made just kind of was born out of necessity because people come and go, you know, but I knew that whenever we were filming a movie, I was always going to be there. So whenever a character needed a car to drive, it was always my character because, you know, if someone doesn't show up, now we don't have access to their car. That's a problem. Now we can't shoot for the day. But then it just kind of became this in joke where it's like, oh, there's Brian's car again. Red Grand Dam's just been around, man. It's been in every movie just about. Just about, yeah. So it was a staple. I mean, if, uh, if the Grand Dam wasn't in it, it wasn't a solid show film. <laughs> That's kind of like been the, uh, the go-to vehicle for every movie. Kind of like uh, Evil Dead movies. He's always had the Oldsmobile in there. You know, it wasn't a conscious choice, but it was like such an in-joke at that point. It was so part of the DNA of our films where I just kind of... Uh, kept bringing it back and I, I probably hung on to it for just a little bit too long because it was, it was starting to get really dangerous to drive. There was a bitchin' ride at one time and the hoods started discoloring and... I, the, the brakes actually blew out on me when we were on our way to film Bloody End. So um, that, that's actually why the one shot of that in that movie is the girl getting out because I just barely made it into the driveway. Thank God nobody got hurt on that one. With an expiration date on the car, Brian would write one final movie to enshrine the vehicle's place in bombastic history. After that incident, I had decided that, you know, I because I, I was kind of kicking around like, you know, we, we should make a haunted car movie just to make the Grand Am a main character and something. And knowing that that was probably going to be the last movie that I would make with that thing after that horrifying white knuckle trip through downtown Dearborn, the next movie had to be Rustine. So we, we made that, and that kind of became a signature. I, I don't know why, because, but it took like the Grand Am joke to the next level, and it was also a really funny movie on top of that. Didn't quite have the money to buy a new car, so it held on for a couple more movies. It's in the very end of it, came from the garage. We actually kind of had a, a literal red herring in that because there's a car in the garage that's red, but it's not the Grand Am. And, and people were like, you know, why, why isn't the Grand Am there? There's a red car, why isn't the Grand Am? And then in the last shot of that movie, you see the creature running down the street, and like there it finally is. So that was kind of a you know, fun reveal just to kind of plan as an Easter egg for people. But the last time it was ever put on film was when we were doing Easy Money because the two characters, their getaway car, the supercharged getaway car is a 1995 Grand Am. <laughs> so, um, but it, at the end of, it doesn't matter which character you pick, the last shot you see is of the thing driving off into the sunset. So I, I love the idea that the last time you see it on film is just kind of going off to that great car park in the sky. While certain aspects of filmmaking get easier with time, the hard work that goes into producing a film never changes. You know what I've heard so many times is like, people will say, I've got this great idea. I'll, all you have to do is film it. I, I hate to say this, but like ideas are the easy part. Getting everybody together, you know, firing off that first shot and knowing that, hey, you know, I actually got a few people to come in and give as at least half as much of a damn about this as I do. Because every movie that you can actually make, whether it's, whether it turns out to be even complete crap or not, it's kind of a miracle that you got it made in the first place. Difficulty on set could be anything in the world as a filmmaker. It could be budget, it could be planning, it could be scheduling. I was producing a project and also working as a cinematographer and we had our second pickup day to finish off the movie and our audio guy doesn't check his email and we didn't find that out till we called him that day. <laughs> and then we called someone else and I think within 30 minutes 
the last person I called and the person who showed up to save our ass was Brian. And he was willing to sit there and make the trip, and I'm still going to take heat to this day. I forgot to tell him how muddy it was. He wasn't wearing his pretty shoes, but he, much like the rest of us, was trailing through clay, and then his shoes probably weighed like 10 pounds more each on each leg. Kind of a fun moment, but it sucked. I went through like two pairs of shoes and probably a clean pair of shorts. It's really organizing getting people together, getting the equipment, because it's not a cheap thing to do, like even at a very low level. Um, but there's been a great democratization of the equipment and costs coming down and, you know, people can shoot movies on their cell phones now where you don't have to have the family video camera uh, breaking your shoulder as you're trying to do that stuff. You literally can shoot a scene, step behind it, hit play and be like, yeah, I didn't like that. Can we do that again? And, and you have the ability to instantly change what you just did. Whereas on you know standard film stock, say 16 millimeter, you may not know for months what you did. And, and with technology, it's instant. You can make or, or change or alter right then and there. Ridley Scott, he worked on commercials for 20 years before he even started working on movies. So he worked in the hardest environment that was, and then he starts going off and making films. Same value, you can look at that from Bombastic Entertainment, whether or not it's fun, but the experience and knowledge to produce a proper product is there because Brian has the experience, and it shows. And the fact that when everybody started, and it's like 20 years ago, there really was an internet. I mean, Al Gore just created it according to him, but the value of that whenever the internet came out compared to the kids of today where everybody can go out, they can buy a camera, and they're like, hey, I've got this. I know what I'm doing. I learned because I went to www. Your answers are all here and you don't have to go to fucking school for anything. com. We should probably buy that com. So that's kind of amazing to me that, like, just that things have changed so much that people are interested in filmmaking, whereas back when I was in high school, it was such an alien concept and you didn't have YouTube to show people things. But now everybody has the internet and they can go out and they can show their friends, hey, this is kind of what I want to do. And then you got a good starting point. And then, you know, you, you can just film things on your phone and it's, it's gonna suck because everybody's first thing sucks. When you watch your first rough cut, and you're, all, all you see are mistakes and that's, everything you're trying to tighten up. But once you finally have like a temp track and some sound effects in there and you can actually sit back with like a beer or a glass of whiskey and just watch that by yourself before you have to really start doing all the hardest work that there is. And you just kind of like figure it out as it goes along and you make mistakes and you just kind of keep growing from there. What we see here is not, I mean, what we see here is not what the audience gets to see. And I think that's really cool is because some instances might require us to do something or make it look like something else and the audience will never know what that was. To them, they're gonna see what the final product was and that's kinda cool. That's like a little movie magic. Forged with passion, ingenuity, and a maverick spirit, Bombastic Entertainment is a celebration of independent filmmaking. And those who were there from the beginning will never forget the 20 year journey of a group of friends through amusing ups and periodic downs while striving to make their handcrafted brand of films affectionately known as Bombastic Entertainment. After 20 years, what does Bombastic Entertainment actually mean? No, it's, and that's the, I don't know how to describe it. It's just, it's gonna be, you're either, go, you're gonna have fun. If you're on the product, on the project, you're gonna have a fun time filming it or being a part of it. And it's something that if you were to see it, you, you would just look at it and you're like, that's going to be good. He's got a, like a vision, you know, like a dream uh, of this. He's, he just, he wants it, you know, and I can see it. And I'd like to be a part of that to help him, whatever it takes. And that's kind of how it started was I, I just took two words that kind of sounded cool. And, you know, I didn't really think it through. But then, like, the more we made movies, the more there was kind of just like an element of the fantastic to all of them, so that's kind of what became in my head what Bombastic Entertainment was, where it's like, it can be anything as long as it's fun, because the goal is to just entertain people.
it's it's always an experience by the way of the unknown. You never know what you're going to walk into on on a, a bombastic entertainment set, you know, because you never know what crazy ideas Brian has for that special effect or that you know that boom or scene or whatever it might be. It's 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 always the unknown and, and the excitement of of trying to become something that you're not. But making it making it believable enough that when somebody watches it on film, they 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 just roll right with it. I don't know. It's just Brian May having fun. That's probably the best part about it. But it's just a fun product to go through. You can sit there and have all these different decisions that he's made or created. And if you look at it, for an independent filmmaker, he's pretty revolutionary in his own creations. Being brave enough to make a stop motion character or do an entire CG shot, having no fear because he knows how it's going to run out because he's been doing it for so long, it's pretty respectable. There's just something really, really fulfilling about that. That you got all these people to come together, everybody actually cared, everybody took away something from it, be it just the experience or networking or even friendship, and created something that nobody else thought of, nobody else came together to do. I like the, I guess this is, this is going to be a cliche answer, but I do like the quality time and like hanging with people and like getting to know new people, um, aside from Steve, who is the one solid person I've known throughout I think ever in my little film career but um, I guess through Steve is how I met Brian so in that instance that's meeting someone new and I, I like that every new project you're going to meet someone new and you don't know who that person is and what you could do for them or what they can do for you. You know what I love about this is it's kind of like playing Mission Impossible in real life because you you put together like these groups of people who hopefully all have a specific skill, like you're the actor, you're the director, the sound guy, and you all come together to kind of like pull off this caper. But it, And at the end of it, you sort of scatter, and you might never see these people again, but there's a document that kind of goes out into the world. There's a finished product that people can kind of look at, and best case scenario, someone's having a miserable day, and then they find the thing that you did on the Internet, and some goofy thing you did puts a smile on their face. You know, that's an amazing thing, and uh, I just, I don't see a downside to what we do. Going? Going. All right. The really real. We're actually For real? Really, really real. real. Uh, two steps to your right. Stop. One step to your left. Right there. Yeah. So, all right, you ready? Yeah. Oh, geez. <laughs> Quick little shit. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta redo that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> So he floored as the camera hit me right in the face. Okay. Slow down. Yeah. Uh, eyes open but looking up. Can you look up more? Why does it look like you're smiling? I don't know. I got my head in the deer trap. Uh. You were saying, motherfucker. Whoa. You're over there. <laughs> <laughs> He's not in there. Go check. I just looked. He's not in there. No, turn on the light and look. Okay. Nope. No one in there. No one in there. Maybe he's hiding in his shower. I don't think he is. Go in there. No. I'm gonna be dead. He's the toughest guy. No, he isn't. You are. Three, two, one. <laughs> hey baby, how you doing? <laughs> you wanna see my skull? <laughs> You're fine. And the creepy spider. <laughs> Let me know when I can. Na 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 na. Take 
Na, 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 na. You're way out of focus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, how do I look in this shot? Tilt that viewfinder down a little bit. You look like a sexy bitch. Does he look like he'd get killed right now? Because I can punch him right now. <laughs> oh. Come on! Oh. oh my god. <laughs> I would like one more, but that's just me. What do you think? Let's do it once more. Damn it, not at a brain fart. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> 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 right. Oh, shit! <laughs> I thought you were. I hope that was a good shot because this ton's done for right now, right? Cut. We sold that shit. Well, Brian De Palma said something really interesting one time where someone asked him at one of these Q and A things, "What do you need to get started making movies? Like, you need two friends who'll work for nothing." <laughs> that's, that's about it. <laughs>